Hey, I'm Ryan Reynolds. Recently, I asked Mint Mobile's legal team if big wireless companies are allowed to raise prices due to inflation. They said yes. And then when I asked if raising prices technically violates those onerous to your contracts, they said, what the f*** are you talking about, you insane Hollywood ass? So to recap, we're cutting the price of Mint Unlimited from $30 a month to just $15 a month. Give it a try at mintmobile.com slash switch. $45 up front for three months plus taxes and fees. Promote for new customers for limited time. Unlimited more than 40 gigabytes per month. Slows full terms at mintmobile.com. When you're ready to pop the question, the last thing you want to do is second guess the ring. At bluenile.com, you can design a one-of-a-kind ring with the ease and convenience of shopping online. Choose your diamond and setting. When you find the one, you'll get it delivered right to your door. Go to BlueNile.com and use promo code WELCOME to get $50 off your purchase of $500 or more. That's code WELCOME at BlueNile.com for $50 off your purchase. BlueNile.com, code WELCOME. Hey friends, this is Russ from Fairfax, Virginia. Do you want more? More Rebecca Laughter? More Kevin Humor? More Toby Ball cynicism? More Lara Bricktacular exasperation? I did. So I went to patreon.com slash partners in crime media and signed up. You should too. I'm Rebecca Lavoie, and this is Crime Writers On, the original true crime review podcast that digs into true crime, pop culture, other podcasts. And this week, decades after fleeing into witness protection with her family, a woman discovers her long lost outlaw biker dad has just committed a double homicide. We'll talk about the new podcast, Relative Unknown. Then it seemed there was no way to loosen the mob's grip on New York City until the feds found a way to nab everyone all at once. We'll discuss the Netflix documentary, Fear City. Joining me to get that done and more is journalist, true crime author, former defense investigator, licensed private investigator, certified cat lady and pet detective, Lara Bricker. Hello, Lara. Hello, Rebecca. Yeah, I am uh, investigating a new career as a pet detective, actually. <laughs> well, we will talk about that in just a minute because I can't wait to hear more about it. Also with us is our captain of woke cynicism, the author behind the noir novels known as the City Trilogy and host of the Strange Arrivals podcast about UFOs and our Patreon book club host, Toby Ball. Hello, Toby. Hello, Rebecca. Well, you may have noticed I skipped one intro this evening, guys. Did you notice? Really? What? (laughs) My fellow true crime co-author and love of my life, Kevin Flynn, is skipping this week. He's having some issues with his voice, and he will be back next week. So we are also skipping our Facebook Watch episode this week so that he can recover with his voice and next week be back in a better shape on both audio and video. So we're just going to have to soldier on without him. Guys, we We've done an episode without Kevin, but it hasn't been for a really long time, right? I don't know if we've ever done without Kevin. It's been so long, I don't remember it. You know which one it was? We actually brought it up last week. It was the episode in which we reviewed White Lies. Oh. Because remember last episode, I was talking about that review, and he like didn't sound familiar to him at all. Oh, yeah. (laughs) Okay. Anyway, that was a long time ago. So it's just going to be the three of us. I'm very excited to hear your thoughts about our topics this week. But before we get into it, a couple of announcements. One, listeners who've been wondering... We are returning to our weekly schedule uh, beginning next week. So this is a weekly episode and so is next week. And next week, we're going to be talking about two podcasts. We're going to be talking about The Sneak, season two, and we're going to be talking about a podcast called Morally Indefensible. So for all of you who've been concerned that we're going to be biweekly forever, no, as always, we're going back to weekly beginning next week. Now, Laura Bricker, before we start the show, I'm dying to hear what is up with your pet detectiving, you sent me a murder board today. I have no idea what's going on. Well, as you all know, uh, that have been listening, my kitty Felix has now been missing for a month. Ugh. And I'm not having a great feeling about this. But I have been spurred on because I've been determined to find out what's going on. As I've been following my local like Facebook groups, like community groups, cats are missing everywhere in my town. What? Aliens. Well, I know. That's what I thought. So I started plotting it on a map. And it's following a pattern. I've got my game camera up all over the place to the point that I actually helped my neighbors across the street find their cat because they were like, 
our cat's missing. And I said, well, when I was knocking on doors, the people next to you may not know have a barn, see your cat all the time. And then they found their cat. Look at you. You're, you're like you're like the Barbara Ray Venter <laughs> DNA detective connecting people with their long lost cats. I'm very impressed. I am. And I'm actually looking at starting a legitimate pet detective certification course in September. <laughs> like for real. Define legitimate when you, when you use it in that context. I mean, Toby, I'm mostly doing all this stuff already anyway. Like I use the flower to see what footprints are out there. Um, I've been putting food and wildlife cameras around. I've been interrogating people. My neighbors um, have a chicken coop up the street and I identified they might be the next hit Hmm. on this killing spree that's happening or suspected killing spree. And so I put my camera there. I'll, I'll share it in our Facebook group. They had a little fun with me. Their children went out and dressed up in outfits and went mm. around in front of my camera this week. I have a question for you. Is there a suspect in this missing cat mystery? Well, unfortunately, I think it's a bobcat. I was going to say a Fisher cat myself. No, I think so. There has been a sighting of a bobcat in town. And whatever it is, is very stealthy mm. because nothing has been picked up on my camera aside from a possum. Mm. some mice and a porcupine. Yeah. And I have moved my camera all over the place and I have found nothing else. Or it's a cat hoarder who's stealing all our cats. Maybe the Texas Rangers have got somebody in a rural prison who might have some information on that. <laughs> the, the other thing, I, I wanted to I wanted to circle back when you said you were interrogating people. Yes, I went, I knocked on doors and I said, hello, I'm looking for my cat. And they were like, oh, yes. And I said, so do you put cat food outside? And they're like, no. I said, really? Hmm. And then I actually, the other day, I went out with a flashlight and I started looking under people's porches to see what was out there. Laura, you know, this would all be solved if you just didn't let your cats go outside. I'm well, just saying. they usually go out during the day, I'll be on, and they come in at night. And on this particular night, Felix wouldn't come back. The cats have all done that and they'll always be there in the morning. Right. So I have an alternative suspect. I just want to flow by you. Who do you think it is? Toby's cat, Littlefoot, who's a well-documented <laughs> killer. <laughs> what do you think, Toby? Could it be Littlefoot? Much like Henry Lee Lucas, I don't think she can be killing as many rodents here <laughs> and also be traveling to Exeter <laughs> to take out cats there. Yeah. I just thought the, ti- the timeline doesn't work out. Oh, yeah. Well. But I've been scooping up more dead rodents. I like. I don't know where they're coming from. Really? I probably, I would say I've disposed of two or three dozen. No, two dozen is way low. Three or four dozen <laughs> rodent carcasses over over the course of the summer. It's been unbelievable. Listen, I'll just make, I'll just make one plug for like dogs here. Dogs vomit and then eat it, which is disgusting, but they do not like kill anything that you then have to clean up. Yeah. <laughs> but they shit and you have to clean it up. You guys, I've even learned, speaking of poop, I've been learning all about animal poop. I'm going to be on that show, Northwood's Law, before you know it. You don't need to be on a show. You can just have your own show if you're going to be an honest to God New Hampshire pet detective. By the way, a little plug for Northwood's Law filmed right here in New Hampshire. It's a pretty good show. Yeah. I really like it. No, it's good. And I talked to them the other day. I talked to the Fish and Game guys I told them what and I was like I'm not crazy I have a murder map and they were like mm-hmm. yep. <laughs> <laughs> not crazy at all all right well should we just get this week's show started with our first podcast review yeah yes all right let's get it done 911 what's your emergency I'm running my trash route over here behind one eyed Jack's liquor store okay and there's a house on fire back here and there's a man sitting in a blue Jaguar watching it burn Okay. I asked him if that was his home burning, and he said yes. Then I asked him if he wanted to move further away from the fire, and he said he wasn't worried about the fire. He said he was worried about the bullets that were going to fly. A 2013 double murder-suicide leads Texas police to a hidden trunk. It contains items leading investigators to believe their elderly perpetrator, Paul Dome, was not who he said he was. He learned that the Department of Justice oversees the Witness Protection Program and they'll neither confirm nor deny the identity of a protected witness. But even without being officially told so, McKnight figured that Clarence Crouch and Paul Dome were the same person. In the podcast Relative Unknown from C-13 Originals, host Jackie Taylor learns Dome was actually her father, a former Hells Angel who took his family into witness protection and later disappeared from her life. Plus, the trunk is filled with items the angels would kill to retrieve, including an unpublished manuscript of his times as an outlaw biker. I'd always heard these fights called rumbles, but I never knew the reason till that moment. 
when all those motorcycle boots start stomping on that wooden floor, it started rumbling through that hall like thunder. The sound kept growing louder and louder until I expected lightning to crack at any moment. Taylor shares her father's story about his violent past and attempt at going straight. She also promises to recall her own tale of growing up as a child in witness protection and the failed promises of the government to give her a normal life. Now, we are going to be talking about plot points from the first few episodes of Relative Unknown. So if you want to remain spoiler free, go to the estimated time code in our show notes. Toby Ball, a couple production notes. Uh, I think this podcast is really well produced and sounds great. But you're not a big fan of the um, dramatic podcast theme song. Without the light, or oh, the darkness come. I'm not a fan of any dramatic podcast theme songs. <laughs> Why not? They're all the same. I mean, it's all these sort of foreboding, sort of blues rockish songs. I'm tired of it. We need something new. Now, I really want to talk about the promise of the podcast because it's called Relative Unknown. We get a lot of teasers about the witness protection program, but here we are a few episodes in and we really haven't heard anything about the witness protection program. Personally, I'm kind of disappointed about that. Laura, what do you think? Ditto. Yeah. So the first episode of this, like I'm listening to it. I'm like, this podcast is awesome. I'd only listened to one episode. I'm like, everybody needs to listen to this. And she's talking, they're talking about, you know, this guy, he was this guy in witness protection. And I'm like, ooh, ooh. And then the second episode starts and I'm so confused. I'm like, wait, how did the daughter leave witness protection program? If she was in witness protection, what's going on? Did she know him? Did she not know? It was very confusing. And I felt like I understand that they were trying to tell this sort of artful sort of story, but I really felt like it could have benefited from like right up front in episode two. Like I went into witness protection when I was whatever years old and I left at these years old and you can do that. And also I hadn't seen my dad in this number of years or something because I still don't understand any of what happened sort of in these intervening years. Like we went from this like murder suicide to now we're reading like the book about the motorcycle gang. And I, I'm just totally confused as to the timeline of everything. I don't know. Was I the only one? No. Okay. You're not the only one. I will say the huge disappointment I feel about this podcast is I feel like the promises, and she says it right in episode one about how the witness protection program fails people. And then we never hear anything about it again. At least we haven't yet. And we're a few episodes in and it really isn't about that yet. And I don't know. I find that a little bit disappointing. I just want to say and I want to ask you guys if I'm alone. I really like Jackie as our narrator um, and the way the podcast uses her. There is some straight reading of narration that she does, but... There's also some narration that feels very much like her end of an interview where she's answering a producer's questions and then they're using that to tie it together. I couldn't believe what I was seeing. It was just rubble. There, were, It was just black, burnt everywhere. And, you know, it dropped me to my knees and I, I was devastated for, you know, everything that the three of them went through. You know, they didn't have to die. He didn't have to do what he did. It reminds me a lot of Kim Goldman in Confronting OJ. Um, it sort of has an organic feel. Toby, what do you think of Jackie sort of as our guide through this story? Uh, I, I think she's really good, quite honestly, and uh, for, for a few reasons. One of which is that I think she kind of grounds the story in the sense of the tragic nature of it all. Because when you get to like the last couple of episodes we've listened to, which are really these sort of wild stories about bikers and crazy stuff they did, you know, I think it's easy to kind of fall into a, oh shit, oh shit, you know, these crazy stories. And I think, you know, because she lived to some degree, she was connected with that and, and with consequences to her. I think it, it does sort of keep it grounded in reality that, that, that this, is, these, this is are actually sort of brutal events with lots. I mean, there's a lot of bodies in, in this podcast. Hmm. You know, a lot of people are getting killed. And, you know, I, it's a little bit different than listening to a journalist tell the story. And, yeah. you know, it's not the first time we've had this. But I do think that you do you do get a sense of her the choices that her father made that we're we're hearing about made her life 
the way it is, which was not easy. Lara, what do you think of Jackie? I mean, one of the things that I really like about her presence in the story, uh, which is a story, by the way, that I have some problems with, just like, you know, as a story to tell, which we'll get into. But one of the things I love is how she introduces us to some of her relatives, in particular, Uh um, her grandparents, and then, of course, her aunt. But now she would tell me that, like, if she got picked on as she got older, you know, and the guys would mess with her or something like that, now she would go and tell him, and he would go and straighten them out. Laura, what do you think about that? Jackie and her family sort of being present in the story in such an organic way. Well, again, I thought it was really interesting, but I still felt sort of a little confused about the context because, again, I was like, so the dad's in witness protection, but now it sort of sounds like his sister was living pretty close to him the whole time that he was Mm. because I I didn't quite put it together until I listened a second time to that episode that they actually went to the scene where the murder-suicide happened and that's where they talked to the sheriff who was like better not have those colors on you you'll get killed that guy so like all the people in this are super interesting I just feel like we needed some more just like more upfront narration as to who people were and timelines and what was happening at different you know like how we ended up at different places in this story all right I have a question to ask of both of you uh you're both professional published writers I'm gonna give you one of Kevin's notes because even though Kevin's not here with us he's here with us in spirit and he did give me some notes to share and here's what he wrote I can't believe and I feel a bit ashamed to say how well-written Butch's manuscript is. At least the bits we're given, he says. His voice is authentic and authentically offensive. We've been given a taste of life at Witness Protection, but I'm looking forward to hearing more about that story. Toby, do you think when you listen to these red portions of Butch's manuscript, do you think this guy was as good a writer as Kevin thinks he is? Yeah, I mean, I, I suspect they might have cleaned it up a little bit. I mean, it, 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 sound, it reads like it's edited, right? But he's got a great voice. Uh, not saying that he comes across as a particularly lovable person, but you know he gets he gets across a certain persona uh, and a sort of philosophy towards life very effectively. You know, I think the fact that it was at least in good shape allowed them to use like long, long portions of it in the podcast. I feel like they they must have done some kind of editing or whatever because it it's, reads pretty polished. I think. What do you think, Laura? Do you think that the this guy was a good writer? This manuscript found in the bottom of this Hell's Angels trunk. It was okay. I I didn't love it as much. I mean, it was okay. I think for me, I didn't really care for the narration where we had the guy like reading like it was him. And and I understand, like, what else are they going to do? I mean, I think they did what they could do with it. But it was it was definitely pretty graphic. So I did feel like it was very authentic as I was listening to the description of, you know, how he met the wife and how, you know, in the beginning, like, she was kind of in the way, but then she kind of grew on him. Like, that all did sound very organic. And I really liked hearing the context of how this, you know, scary biker guy got together with this nurse so it was it was okay. I mean, I just felt like it was like cheesy biker war stories, <laughs> you know. But Toby, you really like the biker war stories. Can you talk about why you find them interesting? Yeah, I mean, I, I I think again, I think you have to not fall into the trap of reading it like it's fiction or listening to it like it's fiction. In that these people are sociopaths. But that being said. Bike gangs, they're interesting to me in that they don't sort of fall into what we usually think of as organized crime. Because I think we usually think of the mafia or like, you know, the Crips and Bloods or whatever, uh, which are largely these urban based crime syndicates. Uh, and I and I actually think like motorcycle gangs do have an urban presence. I, I know in, in Canada especially. But I, I, I don't know. I don't know if it's that they're not more in pop culture or whatever. It just it seems like they inhabit their own kind of space in sort of the criminal organization universe and often are just sort of interacting with each other, hmm. except, you know, in this you hear about uh, the Hells Angels being associated with the Cleveland mob. But for the most part, when you read about violence among motorcycle gangs, it's, it's them fighting each other. You mean a, a war among subcultures, Toby? A little bit of a war among subcultures. 
And then the other thing is the largest bike rally in, I believe, the world is in Sturgis, South Dakota. Yes, it just happened. The second largest is in Laconia, New Hampshire, Yes, which is right by where you know I've been going every summer of my life, basically. But usually there's over 100,000 bikers. Uh, I believe the Hell's Angels have a presence in Laconia, like year round. I think that's that's one of their you know quote unquote clubhouses. That part of it also is I, I, I've found interesting. It's just that 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 kind of culture has been around, or I've been around that culture for a week each year for decades. Now, Lara, I'm going to throw a counterpoint your way. Something that I thought about a lot while listening to this podcast, and I, I just I'm curious to know your thoughts. Mm-hmm. It's sort of like when they talk about the violence and the culture in this community, there are so many passing references to violence against women. Uh, this guy, Butch, we hear that at one point he was convicted of rape. Yeah. We hear that little anecdote that the guy tells uh, on stage, which is supposed to be hilarious, about a guy beating his woman and his dog. That's private business. Yeah. You know, and if that's what he wants to do. Chucky George is beating his old lady. I well, Junkie's it. George, right. Junkie okay. George's dog. I want you to this. Junkie George's dog bit him, right? I didn't to see me, that. this is a personal fan. This is I a didn't personal see it, but If a guy wants to beat his wife and his dog bites him, that's between the three of them, right? There's something about talking about bike culture and just the very passing references to that kind of violence that I just find like it makes me less interested in anything these people are doing or why. I don't know if if that's just me. What do you think? Yeah, I, I noticed that too. And I noticed that the violence was, I don't want to say it was glorified, but it wasn't like questioned. It was just sort of accepted. And it was like like war stories and, and even like, you know, the, the references to the violence against women. And I felt like the podcast didn't view its role as questioning or holding accountable that sort of place in this culture. It was more about telling the story of Jackie and her father and her father's life in the biker world. But it didn't feel like it was going to be taking that step towards, you know, saying, hey, this is pretty bad, (laughs) you know? And even when she's talking to like the uncles and the other people that were like, I mean, they're all like, oh yeah, he gutted that guy. And I'm like, Oh, my God. Like, there was just this sort of acceptance of the level of violence that we were hearing about in such a way that there wasn't really any sort of analysis of it, if that makes sense. No, I agree. And I just found myself thinking over and over again, not only are the people that we're hearing about terrible people, but people we're hearing from telling us about the people are also like maybe terrible people because they seem completely okay yeah. with, you know, what was going on. I don't know. Toby, do you understand where I'm coming from with that? Yeah, I do. And I, and I think it would be easier to comment if we'd listen to the whole season because it seems like at the beginning that that's part of what this is going to be about hmm. is about the effect of violence on you know this family on on the on the on Jackie and you know you start to you start to get that sense of how like her reaction to hearing that her father is dead and, and that he's murdered his wife and stepson and then also sort of this displacement and being put in the witness protection program but i felt like the the beginning was setting them up to be like there are consequences to this that are felt by people who aren't necessarily involved. Well, I think we should do what we do. Let's go around the horn and give our reviews of Relative Unknown, a new podcast from the studio C13. I'm going to go ahead and start and give Kevin's review because Kevin is not here and I would love to have his point of view inserted. Kevin says... I'm a thumbs up. We get two stories we haven't heard much of in the genre, life in a biker gang and life in witness protection. Through his manuscript, Butch comes alive as a fascinating antihero and unreliable narrator. I hope we get more into the mysterious working of witness protection. Production values are strong. Cadence 13 is a big name behind the scenes, providing business and tech support to titles like Catch and Kill and Pod Save America. With an original podcast like this one, they're proving they can hang with the big boys like Wondery and Gimlet. So that is Kevin Flynn reviews. That's one thumbs up. Laura Bricker, I'm going to come to you. What do you think about Relative Unknown? Uh, this is this is a tough one for me because 
I thought the first episode was so interesting and so compelling. And there are a lot of really great details mixed into this. I think I'm going to bring back a thumb sideways on this one because I want to listen to a few more episodes before I make my final determination here. Because I feel like I'm confused about how and when Jackie entered and exited witness protection. And maybe that's all going to come out as we listen. And some of the things in terms of the structure of the story and when different pieces were told were a little confusing. But I feel like maybe it's all part of the master plan. So for now, I'm going to go with thumb sideways. And um, I will certainly check back in in a few weeks and give a different review. What do you think, Toby Ball? Thumbs up or thumbs down for relative unknown? Yeah, I, I actually, I, I really like this. You know, I, I think it does something which is tough, at least for me, which is that there's two strands going on and I'm sort of equally interested in both of them. The strands aren't exactly woven together. Mm. It seems like you go one and then it's like hard stop and we and we start with the other. But, you know, that that hasn't bothered me very much. I, I do agree. I, I spent a little bit more time than I should have trying to figure out what was going on at times, like who was what and and what the relationships were. But for the most part, I, I, I thought it was good. So I'll give it a thumbs up. Yeah, I'm with Lara on this. Um, I also am going to go thumb sideways for this podcast, in large part because uh, we're not doing our Facebook video this week, and I'm not sure Kevin has a graphic set up for a sideways thumb, so I feel a little bit of freedom in giving it that review. I really want to like this podcast. It sounds gorgeous. It's beautifully made, and um, I actually think production-wise, you know, we, we knocked on a podcast called The Orange Tree made by students a couple weeks ago for their over-filtering and their sort of inability to seamlessly go in and out of natural tape, and I think this podcast does it so beautifully. And aside from the theme song, which I also also think is pretty corny. Uh, I, I just I like the way it's put together, the way it sounds, the way it feels. That being said, I'm having a really hard time right now finding um, a white centered story about men who rape and abuse women and kill each other over basically nothing. Super interesting, although I may contradict that in our next review in this podcast. But in this one in particular, I'm just waiting for the meat to be put on the bones. And for me, the meat is the witness protection program stuff. The show is called Relative Unknown. We hear teasers about the witness protection program, and I am waiting for this podcast to make its pivot there. It hasn't yet. And for me, that's why it's getting a hard thumb sideways. Do you ever meet someone who seems kind of off? Whether it's a creepy neighbor or random phone number that keeps calling you, Truthfinder has you covered. You can search for people by name, address, phone number, email, and more. Truthfinder can be especially helpful for running confidential background checks on anyone you're planning to meet from online dating apps. Go to truthfinder.com slash podcasts for a special offer. That's truthfinder.com slash podcasts to access your special offer today. Jewelry isn't a gift you give just once. It's a way to remind your loved one of a beautiful moment every time they see it. Blue Nile can help you find the gift that says how you feel and says it beautifully with expert guidance and a wide assortment of jewelry of the highest quality at the best price. Go to BlueNile.com and experience the convenience of shopping Blue Nile, the original online jeweler since 1999. That's BlueNile.com to find the perfect jewelry gift for any occasion. BlueNile.com. Hey, I'm Ryan Reynolds. Recently, I asked Mint Mobile's legal team if big wireless companies are allowed to raise prices due to inflation. They said yes. And then when I asked if raising prices technically violates those onerous two-year contracts, they said, what the f*** are you talking about, you insane Hollywood ass!" So to recap, we're cutting the price of Mint Unlimited from $30 a month to just $15 a month. Give it a try at mintmobile.com slash switch. $45 up front for three months plus taxes and fees. Promote for new customers for limited time. Unlimited more than 40 gigabytes per month. Slows full terms at mintmobile.com. All right, before we continue on with the show, let's just do a little bit of business. Please consider supporting us at patreon.com slash partners in crime media. Become a patron there. You will get a brand new edition of Married with Podcast. Kevin and I are super psyched. We've gotten some very juicy questions that we can't wait to tackle. Plus, Laura Bricker on her show, Leave it to Bricker, talks about, quote, Looking for Nookie. Can't wait to hear what that's mm -hmm. all about. And of course, oh, yeah. there's a whole great back catalog of Toby Ball's Deep Dive Book Club podcast. Guys, are you interested in hearing about our Patreon patron saints of the week this week? They are Sarah Langlais and Courtney McAlexander. Bless you guys. 
bless you. Was that good? Did I sound reverent enough? Kazoon tight. <laughs> yes. Um, by the way, I also just want to take a moment to do a little shout out to one of our favorite, favorite patrons and favorite listeners of this show. A very good friend of mine who's become a friend in real life through her fandom of this show. She's had a really tough week, and I just want to do a little shout out to Nanita Cranford, one of my all-time favorite friends, fans, and listeners of the show. Nanita, I'm thinking of you, and I hope you enjoyed the edible arrangement I was <laughs> that I sent your way this week. My go-to thing. For when people are going through hard times. Nothing like a little fruit in a vase. <laughs> and uh, for deep dive aficionados, Nandina will actually be a guest on the next one. She is the best. All right. We're thinking of you, Nita, and we love you. Moving on. People once called New York Fun City. Now the police and firemen's unions in New York are calling it Fear City. In the 1970s and 80s, the FBI was unable to make headway against New York City's five mafia families, arresting individual foot soldiers, but not the mob bosses. But the feds changed their strategy and used new laws to target the gangsters as a complete organization. By defining these people as bosses and members of this organization, they're now all joined together. Using RICO, a person can now be convicted because they ordered somebody to commit a crime. So you could now prosecute a group of people who had committed those crimes together. That way you can go after the whole organization at one time. That began an ambitious investigation that required bugging the phones, homes, and cars of the city's biggest mobsters and resulted in discovering the unexpected evidence which tied all the godfathers together. This was billed as the biggest organized crime investigation ever. We were going to bug the mafia. We were going to hear them on the tapes with our very own ears. Netflix's Fear City is a three-part documentary focused on the operation that took down the five families. It features plenty of secretly recorded audio, surveillance video, and interviews with the agents, prosecutors, and gangsters at the center of the sting. Now, we are going to be talking about plot points for Fear City, so to remain spoiler-free, go to the time code listed in our show notes. Now, Toby Ball, I have a well-documented issue with white-centered stories that (laughs) romanticize the bad dealings of bad guys. But I think that Fear City very successfully avoided doing that. What do you think? Uh, Yeah, I agree. I mean, the the focus is really on these kind of colorful cops who took them down. Mm. And I think that I think that's the difference. And I think about Crime Town, where that wasn't the case. And And I think when we reviewed Crime Town, I said, You know, that's one of my issues is that you're asked to look at these guys as being these sort of, you know, characters and, you know, wise guys or whatever. And they're they're nuts. You know, they're violent psychopaths. And this doesn't make any bones about it. As a matter of fact, it kind of calls out the mobsters who are trying to act like they aren't. Now, one of Kevin's notes here, which I agree with, uh, he says, I really like how many players from both sides they got to tell their stories. There's not a single newspaper reporter or historian or other outside looking inner to be found. Super great use of audio tapes and other elements from the case files. And Kevin, of course, like me, especially loved the black bag agent who actually was responsible for planting the bugs, pretending to be the cable guy. Oh, my God. Pretending to be the telephone guy. Laura Bricker, what did you think of that guy? And and what do you think of the use of real people mm-hmm. who were real criminals and real cops and real lawyers and almost no, quote unquote, expert talking heads in this documentary? I want to be that guy who goes in and hides the bugs in the house. Like, that's like <laughs> one of my little, fa- like, literally, as I've been putting my little camera up in my neighborhood, I'm like, oh my God, it's so fun to spy on people. You know, they definitely had a lot of good characters on both sides, especially, you know, all of these retired FBI agents or prosecutors. And I kind of had to like, I was kind of laughing, like Ken and I were watching it and I was like, oh my gosh, like half these people look like they might have been wheeled over from the nursing home, but I like that they're having them like recreate their own stunts. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) 
<laughs> like the, especially when they had the woman, the FBI agent who listened to all the tapes. It was a total immersion into the life of a mafia household. So I never heard so many creative uses of the F word in my life. Yeah, that doesn't look anything like the picture of her that we saw from like 1985 or the guy that's like sitting in the car down under the bridge or something. I'm like, yeah, yeah. I'm like, oh my God. Not quite as good as in The Legend of Cocaine Island when the guy did his own stunts, but you know, A for effort. Right. I mean, I'll just tip my hand. I think this thing is just so gorgeously made, especially the first two episodes. I think it's just beautifully edited and beautifully made. I really love the fact that they only used real characters in the real story. And, you know, as I was giving my review of the podcast we just talked about, like, this is a white male centered story. But it almost feels like a salve to the glamorizing stories of, of violence. And I think it's because we get all these people who were thinking about how to take them down. Like they knew they had to be taken down. I mean, this is where I grew up. I remember like reading about like the Bananos and the Genovese family and the Columbos and the Lucchese family, uh, like in the papers all the time. This was not nothing. This was literally like we all knew like our garbage people like <laughs> working for the mob. It's something that we all knew if you live in the greater New York area and you realize like how small that influence is now compared to how it was. Uh-huh. I-, I just have one one question about the characters in the story, and I'm wondering if either one of you noticed this. Many, many times in the story, we hear somebody, notably, I think, two of the prosecutors in the team, talking about themselves as being very young when this happened. And they, like, the two prosecutors say they were both 29. And we see a photo of them back when they were prosecuting the case, and they look like they were 45 then. Yeah. <laughs> yes. What is up with the 80s where you looked so much older than your actual age? Am I the only person who noticed that? There, there wasn't as much hormones in the milk back then. <laughs> Those dudes had gray hair, Toby. Yeah, the no, those guys like- had male pattern baldness, like. <laughs> but they didn't have like the cute young kind of male pattern baldness. They had like no. they had like the kind you get when you're like 55 with gray at the temples. But I think part of it is these days dudes like that just like basically shave their heads and have like very very mm. little hair. Back then, you just let it flow, you know. <laughs> Go with what you got, a comb over if possible. <laughs> I, but the women looked great. Like the like with the women when they were in their twenties and thirties, they looked like twenties and thirties ish women. The men just looked like terrible. And a lot of them look exactly the same now as they looked back then. I was like, they look better now. But I think that's I think that's a style thing. You know, I mean, it's when you've embraced your baldness instead of growing your hair over your ears and pretending it's not there. Um, Toby, what did you think about actually hearing the real audio that was used as evidence in bringing down the mob? You have that fucking 200 in my hands tomorrow. If you ain't got the 200 in my fucking hands tomorrow, I'll break every fucking bone in your body. I swear to my kids. You understand? You know, of course, we heard the incredible stories about how they got the audio, you know, taking a whole car apart so they could practice installing a bug and like getting it down to the shortest time possible. And then like when the mobsters are sitting in the diner, they they, they drive the van in front of the car so they can go and quickly switch out the bug. We hear the story, of course, about the guy who pretended to be the cable guy. Right. He gets the guy to help him. Can you hold (laughs) this? Well, I stick the bug into your cable box. (laughs) (laughs) But then we actually heard the real tapes. And of course, they talk about a lot of the tape being really boring. But we do hear some incriminating stuff. What did you think of that? Yeah, I think they do. So there's a couple of things. One of which is I think they do a really good job of setting it up. So when you listen to these things, which are not like in and of themselves, all that revealing, but you've been prepped well enough so that when you're here, you're like, oh, okay. And, you know, there's just something about the fact that these are the moments of tape that took down the the New York mob. I mean, there's a power to them, I think. They they use them really well. As somebody who's just been doing Strange Arrivals, you, you've got archival footage and you're trying to figure out how, how best to position it and how you introduce it and all this stuff. And I, I, I just kind of thought that it, it was really judiciously used and, you know, each one of them kind of hit and you're like, oh, okay. Like you can see how it all kind of happened hmm. and why as a juror, you'd be like, this is the way it was. Well, I mean, I think it was interesting. And Laura, you know, you worked as a defense investigator for many years. Mm-hmm. One of the things the prosecutorial team talks about is when they're bringing this thing to court, of course, they uncover that the the 
so-called commission, which is that they basically uncover that, you know, it's not just the the criminal activities of each of these five crime families. It's that they're all working together to basically, you know, block industry in the city, to have criminal conspiracies, to control industries, to siphon millions of dollars in both taxpayer funds and private developer funds in building these buildings and hauling the garbage and concrete and all these industries. They're doing all this, but they're doing it together. But they also know very smartly, I think, that that's kind of a boring story. So they're like, we also need to talk about a murder. Oh, yeah. (laughs) What did you think of just of that idea that like they knew they had to sex it up in order to get a conviction? Well, yeah, because I think that it's definitely you have to think of like who is your like ideal juror, the person who's going to be hearing this case in terms and like how is a story going to play to them? What what is somebody going to latch on to when they hear this story? And I mean, my God, that was the part I kept like, are they, how many times do they show the photo of that guy that got shot? Like, oh was it like 90 times or yes, something? And they he used still to be had, in like, the this... TV news, Lara. They would show those photos in the TV news. They'd be in the covers of newspapers. But he had the cigar. He yeah. still had the cigar. And, and, and so I kept, re- I'm like, <laughs> in what's his in his mouth? I'm like, is that his, how did he not spit the cigar out? <laughs> Oh, my God. Listen, if you're in the mafia and you get shot 10 million times, the least you can do is keep that cigar in your mouth. That was sort of the thing. I guess so. <laughs> yeah, it's the same. The, the pictures of Paul Castellano. Yeah. When he was killed. I mean, didn't you feel like I, I it's funny because, you know, arguably one of the greatest mafia films of all time was Goodfellas, which was a tr- was based on a true story. And, you know, a lot of the characters in this documentary also sort of, you know, it's the same storyline. So we see that. And the, the violence in Goodfellas is so stark and ugly and cold. But that was literally on the front pages of New York City newspapers and on the on the TV news. They would just show it. Um, and it's really, really stark to realize now how little of the, that imagery we see when there is violent crime. I don't know. I think it's really interesting. Another really interesting thread in this documentary, a character that we have come to know in a different context, but who we are reintroduced to through the lens of documentary Fear City, is famous mafia prosecutor Rudy Giuliani. As we developed the commission case, we realized that by controlling the construction units, the mafia controlled the entire construction industry. Rudy Giuliani, prosecutor for the Southern District of New York, pre-mayor days, pre-going to Ukraine and (laughs) potentially planting conspiracy days. Toby, how did you feel seeing him in the context of this documentary in the profession that really brought him to the forefront at at which he was like really good at doing? Yeah. I mean, I think this was in some ways his peak, right? I mean, I guess people would say, you know, his America's mayor moments after 9-11, but taking down the mob... That's something that no, we've been able to do before, right? And they, he came up with the strategy and got the people in the places that needed to have it done. And I think that's where his super aggressive instincts, I guess, uh, really worked out. So he is different than, than what we're used to seeing these days. So it was useful to, to see him back in his early days when he was kind of making his name and, and clearly a big difference in New York. Laura Bricker, what did you think of Rudy Giuliani's origin story as we see it in this documentary? Yeah, I thought it was interesting how he kind of set it up. I think there was a quote at one point where he talked about how he was a tough kid and he was a boxer and he said, like, I could have been a wise guy, too, but... You know, I took this path and and I was like, you know, watching how clean cut and aggressive and like on the straight and narrow he was when he was prosecuting the mob. I mean, I think you know what it is now. I think that we see a lot more scandal following him around now. Like there's like issues with like women. I mean, at one point, wasn't he having an affair with some woman in New Hampshire? I mean, like he also married his cousin. He also married somebody else. And his wife found out that he was giving her a divorce on a TV press conference. Like he's not a perfect person even before all the current stuff. But I feel like when we see this early version of him, there was like sort of still like this earnest prosecutor. Yes. Good guy. And and then you're hearing like all this other stuff. And you're like, wow, what what happened over the years? It was very interesting to me, Laura, to see his... um, current day interview about this yeah and he sort of talks you know like he's kind of upset about how you know my wife was getting threats and my first question was like which one 
<laughs> uh, it was very, it's just very interesting the way that it was put together. I just want to uh, throw one of Kevin's notes out here for us to just ponder on. Uh, he thinks the FBI shouldn't have been surprised the five families were operating together because didn't they see the first Godfather film? <laughs> Remember, he says in Brando's voice, it was Barzini all along. Yeah, he's right. Uh, quick question before we do our review. Lots of nicknames in this documentary for the mobsters. We hear about Fat Tony. We hear about Big Mike. Have you guys ever thought about what your mafia name would be? Lara the Lookout. <laughs> Toby, what do you think? What Lara's nickname would be? <laughs> no, didn't you hear my name? I'm Lara the Lookout, Toby. And I'm He's I've avoiding got... the question. Jeez. Toby the Tiger. <laughs> Toby two times. I feel like these, I feel like this is like mafia names that like third graders come up with. <laughs> Listen, I'll just be Fat Rebecca along with Fat Tony and Fat Mike. I'm fine with it. I'm totally fine with it. All right. Well, let's do what we do. Let's let our listeners know. Should they check out Fear City on Netflix? We're going to give our thumbs up or thumbs down reviews to this three part documentary. Really ambitious historical look at the takedown of the five families in the mafia in New York City. Laura Brecker, I'm going to start with you. Thumbs up or thumbs down for Fear City? For me, I'm going to be honest, this is sort of a lukewarm thumbs up. It kind of dragged for me, honestly, throughout. It was like a little bit dull at times. I was like, we were talking about how they spiced up the trial with the murder. And I kind of felt like like Ken and I were watching it. And I said, is it me or did you just lose track of what happened? Because they're doing kind of the same thing over and over here. So it definitely, I felt like I was glad it was only three episodes because I just felt like if you were really interested in the mob and the mafia and that time period, I think that this is great for me. I just like it's a subjective thing. It just it wasn't something that I loved, but it was something that was very well done. So I don't really feel like I can give it a thumbs down. I just I didn't love it like I'm sure some of you other people did. Well, Kevin Flynn did love it. His review, he says, this is a strong thumbs up from me. It's told without too much romance. It's an old school procedural documentary, visually interesting, captured a real feeling of its own. 100 little stories make up a narrative like this, Kevin says. The title is not great, he notes. The focus isn't the New York of the 70s. Even something like The Godfather Tapes or Mob Wire would have been better, Kevin says. Regardless, I feel like I learn something while being entertained perfect binge watch so kevin is a big thumbs up toby ball what about you thumbs up or thumbs down for fear city i I think i i said before that i thought this was like a perfect kevin program (laughs) you did you actually texted us and i believe you said you guys have to watch fear city on netflix kevin will love it yeah so i i liked it a lot you know if it had been me i'm a little bit of the opposite of laura in that or, or maybe these sort of side alleys might have made it more interesting for Laura, but I I kind of felt like there's some things that were kind of hinted at that I thought were somewhat more interesting than the whole concrete business and the, and the way they tied it all together. Although I thought that was, that was pretty interesting, but I don't know. They just kind of hinted at the, the two mafia guys that they had on, on tape uh, of sort of the lifestyle and, 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 and what they did with their time. Uh, I thought I thought it was pretty interesting the little quick look we got at it. So I think sometimes there wasn't quite a sense of exactly what was at stake in taking down the mafia in New York. You just I think it was just sort of understood that yeah they're big they're not good you know you want to get them. And then there is this kind of funny thing which at least for somebody who's my age. It's like John Gotti yeah. was the big guy. It's like Ca- Castellano seems like almost a historical figure because John right. Gotti was always, you know, I think at the end when, when Castellano is killed and then you see John Gotti, you're like, oh, okay, you know, now we're going to get to this part and it just ends. Yeah. Uh, and it's like, oh, it ends like right at the point where I sort of was more aware of what was going on. But all that being said, I, I thumbs up. I thought, I thought it was good. It's, it's super well made. The story's good. I think, uh, again, it's it's nice to have the attention put on these sort of colorful cops who were doing a job that must have been scary as hell. And, you know, this small handful of people, uh, you know, took down the mob. So good on them. Yeah, I agree. I actually found this to be superbly entertaining. I think some of the editing in it is a real achievement. We got incredible archival footage of the places 
Um, not just of, you know, literally every time they'd show an FBI agent, they would show a photo of that same agent like back in the 80s. It was incredible how they were able to pull it all together. The sort of drone footage of the city wasn't drone footage. It was helicopter footage at the time of the city. At the time these stories took place, it felt there were there were moments in this, especially episode one, which was so tight. There were moments that felt like we were watching a story in real time, even though it took place what, 30 plus years ago? And it was just really tightly made and beautifully produced. And I love that. And I will agree, Toby, I would have loved to have seen some of the gaudy years in there, but that's just like preference because of my age. And I do think that, again, you know, as Laura mentioned with our previous review, the guys they interview on camera who are actually in the mob, they do get a bit of a pass. That being said, they did serve time for the crimes they committed. They are talking about it with some sense of of scale and scope and in some cases regret in some cases not anyway i just think it was really interesting big thumbs up for me for fear city i kind of think it's like a perfect sunday binge so i would definitely check it out do you ever meet someone who seems kind of off whether it's a creepy neighbor or random phone number that keeps calling you truth finder has you covered you can search for people by name address phone number email and more TruthFinder can be especially helpful for running confidential background checks on anyone you're planning to meet from online dating apps. Go to TruthFinder.com slash podcasts for a special offer. That's TruthFinder.com slash podcasts to access your special offer today. Jewelry isn't a gift you give just once. It's a way to remind your loved one of a beautiful moment every time they see it. Blue Nile can help you find the gift that says how you feel and says it beautifully with expert guidance and a wide assortment of jewelry of the highest quality at the best price. Go to BlueNile.com and experience the convenience of shopping Blue Nile, the original online jeweler since 1999. That's BlueNile.com to find the perfect jewelry gift for any occasion. BlueNile.com Hey, I'm Ryan Reynolds. At Mint Mobile, we like to do the opposite of what Big Wireless does. They charge you a lot, we charge you a little. So naturally, when they announced they'd be raising their prices due to inflation, we decided to deflate our prices due to not hating you. That's right. We're cutting the price of Mint Unlimited from $30 a month to just $15 a month. Give it a try at mintmobile.com slash switch. $45 up front for three months plus taxes and fees. Promote for new customers for limited time. Unlimited more than 40 gigabytes per month slows. Full terms at mintmobile.com. Now it's time for my favorite part of the podcast, a little something I like to call the crime of the week. Zookeepers in Warsaw have a new idea about how to treat the stress levels of three African elephants in their care. To help them chill out, they're giving elephants medical marijuana. The herd has been anxious since the death of their alpha female, so the caretakers are giving the pachyderms high-concentration CBD oil through their trunks. This treatment has been used in horses and dogs, but this is a first for elephants. Zookeepers say it's an attempt to use natural alternatives to pharmaceuticals. It will take two years before they can determine any clinical results, but early checks show improvements in their behavior and hormone levels. No word if they've suddenly become paranoid and saying, hey, man, do you feel like people are watching us in this zoo? Panel, here's my question for you. If these elephants are going to be proper stoners, what other paraphernalia do the zookeepers need to get them? Lar Bricker, I have a feeling you'd be really good at answering this question. What do you think? <laughs> um, I think they're going to need some Doritos <laughs> and some mint patty frozen yogurt <laughs> and mint patty frozen yogurt. some BL teas and maybe some Sprite. <laughs> Toby Ball, what do you think? If these elephants are going to be proper stoners, what other paraphernalia do the zookeepers need to give to them? Laura kind of took the whole munchies thing away. <laughs> <laughs> so, I, you know, I think they're going to have to like throw on to Almond Brothers at Fillmore East and then... Uh, <laughs> Maybe repurpose the penguin pool as a as a <laughs> elephant sized bong. I don't know. <laughs> well, I was gonna say, Toby, with the trunks. I mean, that was my answer. Aren't they gonna need like the world's biggest bong? Yeah. <laughs> All right, we should probably end on that note before we do. Lara Bricker, do we have a cat of the week this week? 
We do. Oh, we have a dog this week. Yes, my favorite animal. And I don't know who the person really is, but they are known as Stephanie Sassy Pants. Nice. In our official Crime Writers on Facebook discussion group. Yes. Hello, Stephanie Sassy Pants. I know who you are. And the dog is, this is Tyson. He likes to watch American Greed and Forensic Files with me every night before bed. Nice. His favorite game to play is Dead or Napping, which is when he chooses random places to nap so soundly, I have to check him to see if he's breathing. <laughs> and there's some pictures, dead or napping pictures that go nice. along with Stephanie's submission. All right, Laura Bricker, if folks want to reach out to you online, perhaps on Twitter to submit their cats, dogs, definitely dogs, and all kinds of other animals to be cat of the week. How can they find you? At Laura Bricker. And Toby Ball, if folks want to reach out to you and give you tips for turning a giant penguin pool into a giant elephant-sized bong, how can they find you on Twitter? Yeah, send those tips to at Toby Ball and H. And if you want to reach my husband and love of my life, Kevin Flynn, you can find him at Kevin P. Flynn. And if you want to follow me on Twitter or Instagram, you can find me at Reb Lavoie. You can also follow the show on Twitter at Crime Writers On. And I encourage you to join the amazing community in our official Crime Writers On Facebook discussion group. We also have a regular old Facebook page, by the way. Support the show on Patreon.com slash Partners in Crime Media, and you'll get the Crime Writers On After Show right now. Plus, Married with Podcast, Toby Ball's Deep Dive Book Club Podcast, and Laura Bricker's amazing Leave It to Bricker Podcast. Our theme song was performed by the New York Scott Jazz Ensemble and used with permission. Our line editor is the very handsome, bearded Henry Lavoie. Our social media newsletter maven is fellow Taco Bell stan Meredith Plunkett. This show was recorded in the yoga loft above the bodega in Bay St. Louis, Mississippi studio, otherwise known as Studio C, the closet in our New Hampshire basement, where we record all of our phone calls on 1970s era reel-to-reel tapes. On behalf of all the crime writers, thanks so much for listening. We'll catch you later. You sound a little bit like you're limiting out over there. I don't know if you can turn down your gain a little. Yeah. <laughs> Jesus. It sounds like you're in a wind tunnel. Really? And you've got line noise, like a big, like big whiny line noise. Yeah. Can you guys hear me now? Oh my God, what? Jesus yeah. Christ, it's Laura! I haven't even changed anything on it. Turn your gain to zero and turn your send audio way down. Turn it down, Karen. <laughs> I'm about to send it. <laughs> Just called her Karen. In crime crime media. Media. You can live out your master chef dream when you find a professional on Angie to tackle your dream kitchen remodel. Connect with skilled professionals to get all your home projects done well. Visit Angie.com. You can do this when you Angie that.